right. Hello, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Noe Santos with the Bureau of Reclamation, and we are very pleased to have Colonel Reese, a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey's Office of Surface Water, where he is the, where he is the National Coordinator for the StreamStats Program. He has managed the StreamStats Program since its inception in 2001. Colonel also worked in the Massachusetts USGS office for 22 years and in the Maryland USGS office for six years. This webinar is being hosted by the CMQ-1 team due to the application of a decision support system for use in resource conservation, planning, and management activities. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you to Colonel Reese for sharing this work with us. I am now going to turn it over to Colonel to begin the presentation. Colonel? Thank you, Noe. Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay, I just want to make sure I wasn't still on mute. So yeah, I'm Colonel Reese, and uh, I'm going to give you a presentation today on the StreamStats web application. I'm going to provide a brief description of it, a history and a status. I'm going to talk about StreamStats versions 2 and 3 and describe how everything works, how it's implemented for a state, and uh, discuss the goals that we have for fiscal year uh, 2015, which ends September 30th, uh, 2015, and also for our next fiscal year as well. So uh, StreamStats is a web service-based mapping application that provides information that can be used by engineers, hydrologists, managers, planners, and others to make informed decisions on water-related activities. Primarily, what StreamStats provides are basin delineations, uh, computed basin characteristics and estimates of stream flow statistics, and it provides that information both for gauged and for user-selected ungauged sites on streams. It also allows use of stream network navigation for information discovery and analysis, and I'll talk more about that later, and uh, there's some additional functionality for some areas. StreamSets is used for engineering in the design of bridges, culverts, and other structures. It's used for floodplain management and determinations of flood zones and for emergency preparedness. It's used in water and land management for water rights adjudications, for water and land use planning, for determining in-stream flow needs and fish passage and habitat studies. Um, and also for water quality regulation, to determining uh, low flows for point discharges and uh, that sort of thing, and also for determining uh, perennial versus intermittent streams. So the StreamStats application is uh, developed by, by a national team that consists currently of eight people. Uh, as Noe said, I'm the coordinator of that team, and uh, we have, in addition, six uh, GIS specialists on the team, uh, actually five, uh, and um, two programmers. I'm the only person on the team that works full time. The rest of the people on the team work half time or less, and no two of us are in the same office throughout the country. Uh, in addition to the team members, we have some contractors. We contract to the USGS NG Talk facility in Denver to uh, host our IT infrastructure and maintain it. And then we also contract to ESRI for GIS programming and for Aquaterra consultants for database programming. So there was an initial version of StreamStats that was developed for Massachusetts back in the 1990s uh, using a uh, custom Java applet connection between ArcView and ArcView IMS. It was made available to the public in 2001, and it addressed the problems of making information from a lot of old reports that were out of print or not readily available, uh, made those available to, to users. And also, uh, avoiding the large labor costs for manually delineating drainage basin boundaries and obtaining basin characteristics that are needed as input into regression equations for estimating flow statistics. So shortly after the Massachusetts application became available to the public, the USGS Office of Surface Water decided that that kind of functionality would be useful to have nationally, and uh, it 
started a national program and asked me to, to head it up. Uh, and that's when the national effort began. Uh, the first thing we determined is that the application that we built in Massachusetts was not going to be scalable for use nationally. And so what was done is that the USGS entered into a uh, cooperative research and development agreement with ESRI Incorporated to uh, help us build the national stream stats. And in the course of doing that, uh, stream stats became highly integrated with the Arc Hydro uh, data model and tools. Uh, and Arc Hydro is a uh, free add-on to ArcGIS software, and it was developed primarily through a consortium at the University of Texas at Austin. So the first state that was released in the, the national application of strange tests was Idaho, and that was in 2005. And since then, we, we've added many more states. Uh, each state is implemented using the spatial projection that's preferred by that state. And the reason we took that approach was that um, we didn't want to have to be the distributors of the data uh, if, if, uh, if it was requested. And so uh, by putting in a state projection, the individual states can distribute the data when requested. So um, the national development team actually gets its funding from the USGS National Streamflow Information Program, and we have a budget that averages around $475,000 a year. Uh, the other source of funding is that for each state that is implemented in stream stats, we assess the local water science center about $5,000 a year for the cost of maintaining the computer infrastructure. We have water science centers in most states. There are some that that are merged, uh, but we charge them by the state. Um, and then uh, it's actually implemented on a state-by-state -state basis where the water science centers enter into cooperative agreements with other entities, usually state agencies, who provide at least half of the funding needed to implement the states. On average, the implementation cost is about $300,000 and more often than not, regression equations are updated as part of that effort. So this map shows the 32 states that are implemented now in green. Uh, there's one state, Arizona, that uh, is implemented to compute basin characteristics, but you can't get estimates of flow statistics for ungauged sites in, in Arizona. Uh, we have two states, Montana and North Dakota, that are about to be released, and they also will, will just compute basin characteristics. Uh, in addition, we have seven states that are in the process of being implemented, and then the yellow states on the map are uh, not participating at this point. So uh, in regards to the area of interest for the Desert LCC, uh, Arizona is, as I mentioned, it's implemented, but it computes only the basin characteristics. Uh, there's a new report that was published in 2014, actually two reports, uh, flood frequency and a flood volume uh, report, and we expect to have the equations from those reports implemented within the next several months. Uh, California uh, has, uh, is serving peak flow frequency equations from um, a 1977 and a 1997 report. Uh, we're in the process of implementing uh, equations from a 2012 report, and those will be released within a few months as well. New Mexico uh, has peak flow equations from a uh, 2008 report, uh, but it's only available for a small portion of New Mexico in, in the northwestern part of the state. Uh, the state office there is in the process of preparing some additional data. Uh, they had been trying to use uh, medium resolution NHD plus, and now they're waiting for the availability of high resolution NHD plus. I'll talk about what NHD plus is in a, in a little bit. Uh, Nevada and Texas are not participating at this point. There has been some interest in getting a strange stats application in Nevada, but 
to date, uh, no state agency has come forward to uh, cooperate with the local office. And we don't have stream stats in Mexico. Um, it, if there were regression equations available in Mexico, it probably would be possible to set up an application there. We're um, now working on an application for uh, an area within Canada, so there is some precedent for that. So the StreamStats homepage is at streamstats.usgs.gov. And uh, you'll notice right away uh, there's a big yellow box at the top of it that talks about transmission to uh, version 3. And I'll describe that a little bit more uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but on the main part of the page is a description of what StreamStats is all about. And then on the left side, is a gray box with a whole bunch of links to uh, descriptions of the outputs, to uh, user instructions, to troubleshooting tips, definitions of the uh, of, uh, statistics that are provided, and a lot of other things. There's actually two links to different applications. The USGS station statistics um, link will take you to a national application that provides just information for data collection stations, but it's available everywhere. And then if you want information for ungauged sites, uh, you'd click the station applications button and it'll take you to this page where it shows you a status map and there's a pull down list that you can select the state from the list or you can simply um, click on a state on the map to go to um, that state's application. So as I mentioned, we're transitioning from version 2 to version 3. And version 2 is what's on the web now. Uh, and it has to be retired by July 14th. And the reason for that is the servers that we use to uh, serve version 2 are using uh, the Windows uh, server 2003 operating system and uh, it's no longer supported by Microsoft and our uh, IT management within the USGS is pulling the plug on us by July 14th. So we're trying to rapidly migrate all of our state applications to version 3. We now have it available for 15 states, but the functionality is, is limited. Uh, you can get information for gauges, you can delineate drainage basins, you can get basin characteristics, you can get flow statistics from regression equations, and you can download shape files. But that's about all you can do with version 3 at this point. So uh, for the states where we've implemented version 3, we've, we've also uh, allowed version 2 to remain available so that if people want to use navigation tools, they can do that with version 2 until the July 14th cutoff. At that point, everything will be on version 3, and we're going to be losing that navigation capability until we can uh, reprogram it. And um, so version 3 actually has a single national user interface, whereas version 2 had a separate interface for each state. Um, so at the point where we are entirely over to version 3, the uh, the link to the state applications that you saw on the main page will disappear and there'll be a link that'll just take you directly to the user interface. Um, and we also have version 4 in development and uh, we'll be implementing all the network navigation tools and so forth in version 4 and we plan to uh, start releasing that in the fall. So this is the introductory page for North Carolina, which is the state that we uh, clicked on on the map before. And at the top is a description of the kinds of statistics that are available uh, for uh, estimation at ungauged sites. There are links to the reports that uh, contain the, the equations that allow you to get those estimates and uh, describes how those uh, equations were developed and so forth. You have a link to the application. You have a link to metadata, uh, which describes uh, all the, the different uh, basin characteristics that you can measure and, and the sources 
and the methods for those basic characteristics and that sort of thing. And then below that would be any um, individual uh, information that, that uh, is relevant to, to that state's application and probably about half the states have some kind of special information that we provide. Now, as we go to version three, uh, the 15 states where we have in ver version three available, instead of just one interactive map link, you'll see a version two interactive map link and a beta version three interactive map link. So this is the version two user interface. I won't go through it in detail since it's gonna be phased out pretty shortly. But uh, you'll see across the top a whole bunch of buttons that allow you to move around in the map and, and uh, get information and so forth. And then on the left, there are some panels. There's a map contents panel that allows you to display uh, or turn off display of various layers on the map and so forth. Um, so the basic functionality of uh, version two is uh, again, as I said, moving around the map, getting information for stream gauges, delineating and editing watersheds for user selected sites, computing a variety of basin characteristics, estimating flow statistics for user selected sites based on regression equations, modifying the basin characteristics that were used as the explanatory variables in the regression equations and getting new estimates, uh, getting land surface elevation profiles, printing the map, and downloading shape files of the basin boundaries. And if you computed basin characteristics and flow estimates as well, you'll get those in the shape files also. So then there's network navigation function uh, functionality. There's several tools that can be used to traverse the stream network, locate events, provide information about the events, analyze the network pathways, and get stream channel profiles. The navigation can be done on the high resolution NHD, which is generally one to 24,000 scale uh, stream network or better. Uh, and then there's also uh, NHD plus, which is based on medium resolution NHD, which is at a scale of one to 100,000. Uh, and then there's numerous national data sets that have been linked as events to the NHD and NHD plus. And uh, you can go to the websites for NHD and NHD Plus that you can see here to find out what data sets uh, have been linked to those, those uh, uh, stream networks. So to understand uh, stream networks and, and uh, navigation and so forth, I'm showing you this cartoon here where the, the green uh, cross is a user selected site. The, the black line is the basin boundary. The blue is the stream network. And then you've got a stream gauging station. You've got a uh, point discharge, a water withdrawal, a biological sampling site, and a dam uh, located upstream. And so with network navigation, you can uh, look upstream and identify all these different types of features, uh, whatever has been indexed to the network, and get information on them. And the way it works is that uh, within the, the stream network, uh, usually a reach is a section of stream between confluences. And each reach is assigned a reach number. And then events, which are the dams and so forth, um, are assigned an address which consists of the reach number and the measure. And the measure is the percentage of the distance from the downstream end of the reach to the uh, reach event. And so uh, several of the tools require you to configure how the, the navigation uh, tracing is going to work. So here you see uh, Maryland stream stats and uh, you see a delineated basin and you see a bunch of dots and things. Uh, the, a blue dot is a water withdrawal. Uh, the red diamond is a gauge and the red kind of circles are biological sampling sites. Um, so what we're going to do is we're fir first going to configure how the trace is going to work. And we can select whether we want to uh, trace on the NHD plus and uh, it shows below the layers that are associated with that. 
the flow lines themselves and then point discharges are on NHT Plus for Maryland. Or you can select the HydroNet, which is actually high resolution NHD. And we'll select that and you can see again there are flow lines, there's water quality sites, there's biological sampling sites, there's dams, there's gauges and a few other things. And so uh, we, a we actually could select whether we're tracing upstream or downstream. We've turned off the flow lines because you get a whole lot more information. You get a line and an output for every flow line and there could be thousands of them. So we've turned that off and now we're going to say OK. And uh, then we click on trace from outlet and we get an output that looks like this where it tells you the date and time and so forth, uh, what you traced on, uh, the trace direction, the reach address, the latitude and longitude, and then a table for each different layer uh, that you selected to participate in the trace. And so you can see there are a whole bunch of biological sampling sites found here and you can click on the entries that are blue, those are hyperlinks, and that will take you to an online database for the biological sampling sites from Maryland, and you can get all kinds of information about the fish and the water quality and the invertebrates that uh, were found for, for all these sites. And then you go back to the map and you can see they've been highlighted on the map. So uh, other tracing tools that we have are you can do an ad hoc trace or uh, trace from a delineated point and uh, display the identified reaches and points as I just showed you. And then there's a, a raindrop trace to network. And what that does is it displays the path from um, any point on the map. Um, and it, it, it will trace the path across the land surface to the point at which um, the raindrop would enter the stream network. So the point selected here is the blue point. The green point is where you enter the stream network and the red is the pathway. And it will follow the path on down. Uh, it also gives you the reach code uh, for the green point. Um, and the measure, and it'll follow the, the, the path downward either until you reach the ocean or to the bottom of a four-digit hydrologic unit. So we also have some other um, tools that, that provide profile plots. Uh, there's the trace flow path within a delineated watershed, and it's very similar to the raindrop trace where you can pick any point on the land surface and it will trace down to uh, the basin outlet. And then there's also the show network path and profile where you can pick any two points on the stream network. They don't have to be upstream and downstream, but they have to be uh, connected in, in some way. And with both of these tools, you can get an elevation profile uh, between the, the points. Uh, it'll give you the, the plot and it'll also show the data. And you can save the data to Excel by hitting the button. And uh, here's uh, what it looks like in Excel. So um, there's also the flow estimation based on similar gauges. So we're back here at this delineated basin in Maryland. And um, you can see upstream, I mentioned there's a diamond that uh, is a stream gauge. And um, so what this does, you, you uh, click the button and uh, you get a a little pop-up that says uh, whether you want to use regulated stations or not. And you need to decide um, what to do there. Um, when you get estimates of flow from regression equations, those regression equations assume that natural stream flow conditions exist at the site that you selected. So if you want to use a nearby gauge to estimate stream flow statistics and that gauge is affected by regulations from dams or water withdrawals or so forth, then you would not want to check this box. If you uh, are on a regulated stream and you want your flow estimates to more uh, uh, reflect the actual regulation that's going on, then you would want to select the box. So. You need to think about that. Anyways, we're going to select the box and then we're going to click on Estimate Flows and you get an output that looks like this. 
Um, it gives the uh, reach address at the top, it gives the drainage area, and it says that you've selected to use regulated stations. Then you get a table for all the gauges that are upstream and another table for the gauges that are downstream. It gives the station IDs and names, the drainage areas, the drainage area ratio, which is the drainage area for the gauging station divided by the drainage area for the site that you've selected and also whether the site is regulated or not. And so this functionality will work if this ratio is between 0.5 and 1.5. So in this case, we found one gauge upstream and one gauge downstream, and both of these gauges have ratios that are within the 0.5 and 1.5 range. Uh, so below that, what, what happens next is it takes those gauges, um, it goes into a database, it finds all the statistics that are available for those gauges and their drainage areas, and um, it uh, extracts those out and then generates a table. So uh, at the lower part of this output that you see is the output for the upstream site. So it's listing out all of the flow statistics for the upstream site, and the flow factor is the drainage area ratio uh, is the inverse of the drainage area ratio. So it, uh, it multiplies, the, it's basically multiplying the flow per unit area uh, by the flow factor to get an estimate, an estimated value for the uh, ungauged site. And it's doing that for all the statistics that are available. This is all for the upstream site. And then it does it for the downstream site. And then in the end, because you've got an upstream and a downstream site, what it does is it's, it's giving you weighted estimates that are uh, more or less interpolated based on the drainage area for your gauge site, for your, I mean for your selected site and the, and the drainage areas for your ungauged sites. So that's what happens when you have the upstream and the, the downstream site. When you have only an upstream or a downstream site, it uh, it matches up the flow estimates from uh, that, you, that you've generated based on the gauge with estimates from regression equations. And wherever uh, there are estimates from both methods, it uses a weighting process that gives more uh, weight to the gauge-based estimates than to the regression estimates the closer your gauging station is to your ungauged site. And uh, the report that you see here um, describes how that's done. So we have some improvements that are planned for this uh, methodology when version 4 comes out. There's a couple weaknesses in, in uh, the way it works now. One is that sometimes the closest gauge uh, isn't the best gauge to use. Uh, sometimes the, the gauge might only have a few years of record, so the flow statistics at that gauge aren't very representative of long-term conditions, or the gauge may not have a flow statistic that you're interested in, in receiving. So uh, we're changing it so that initially it'll, it'll uh, work the way it, it does now, but then it'll ask you, do you want to select a different gauge, and you can uh, choose a different gauge and um, and, and get uh, new results. And we're also going to have some minor changes to how things are weighted. And that's going to happen within, within the next three to six months. Eventually, we're going to be replacing all that with a new method uh, of weighting that uh, doesn't require you to have to have drainage area ratios between 0.5 and 1.5. So another tool that we have is a terrain profile tool where you can pick any point, in a point or a number of points on the landscape and uh, get a profile. So you click on the tool button, you select several points, you double click at the end, and uh, you get a result that looks like this where uh, you get the plot of the profile and the yellow uh, dots that you see are the sites uh, that you've selected. Again, you get all the data. Uh, the user point is true for the yellow spots there. And then again, you could save that to Excel if you'd like. So version 3, as I mentioned, is coming along now. 
it transitions from version 2, which was de developed using ArcGIS Server 9.2, and it transitions over to ArcGIS Server 10.1 and 10.3. Version 3 features a single national user interface, but still the state applications are working in the background. It adds several options for zooming decisive interest. Uh, it adds options for selecting which regression equations to use for estimating flows. But as I mentioned, the functionality is limited right now. Uh, uh, we were originally planning on version 3 to um, be around for a while, but we've decided that we want to totally revamp the user interface to make it more user, uh, user friendly. Um, and so uh, now version 3 is going to be an interim uh, product and it's going to be replaced by version 4 uh, hopefully before the end of the calendar year. So the version 3 user interface is what you see here. Um, it's not hugely different than version 2 but you see a whole lot less buttons across the top. So the buttons that we have across the top now are zoom in, zoom out, pan, go back to the previous uh, map view, go forward to the last one, if you've gone back before, go to the initial view, the identify button, and the gauge info button. So uh, all, there's other ways you can zoom around. We now have a sliding zoom scale where if you click at the top or the bottom of the scale, you, you move one step along the, the uh, scale that you see, or you can grab uh, the button on the scale and move it up several at a time. There's also these edge buttons where if you click one of the buttons along the edge, it'll move the map in that direction. And we also have several new zoom to tools where you can zoom to a latitude and longitude, a stream gauge number or name, uh, a place name, an address, a state, a regional study, or an ad hoc. Uh, an ad hoc would be like some states you can zoom to the location of a bridge or a biological sampling site, that sort of thing. So one thing that, that goes on with um, having a national application with one user interface and they're all connected, the one user interface is connected to a bunch of state applications is that when you zoom in, we have overlapping data uh, for many of these states because you know, river basins are not bound by state borders. So we've zoomed into a site here that happens to be in Maine, but we have the data processed for New Hampshire uh, as well as Maine at this location. So at this point, you have to tell it which application you want to use. And since we know we're in Maine, we're going to select the Maine application. And once you make a selection, then it draws the stream grid that's available for that state. And once uh, the stream grid is showing, then you can uh, click on the uh, delineate button and then on a point on the stream, and it will uh, draw the basin boundary for the uh, site that you selected. One thing to note, um, in version 2, you've got a, a very detailed basin boundary. In version 3, the basin boundary is somewhat generalized, so uh, it can, we can deliver these boundaries more quickly that way. Um, but anyways, once you have the boundary, then you get this little pop-up that provides three different additional buttons, one for basin characteristics, one for flow estimates from regression equations, and the download button. So to get basin characteristics, you simply click on the basin characteristics button. Then you get a uh, dialog box that opens up and it allows you to, uh, well, by default, you're going to get all of the basin characteristics where you can click the All button off and then select uh, the basin characteristics individually and then click on the Compute button. And you get an output that looks like this uh, where you have labels, the values, the units of measure, and definitions. So to get flow estimates, it's pretty similar. You click on the flow estimation button, and um, different states have different types of regression equations available. Uh, in, the, in the DLCC area, only uh, peak flow frequency equations are available. 
But in Maine, you've got bank full flows, low flows, mean monthly flows, median monthly flows, and peak flow uh, uh, regions. And so, uh, again, like the basin characteristics, you can choose to compute all those uh, flow statistics or just certain types. And we're going to do all of them. And then you get an output that looks like this. And in the output, um, it gives you the, the state, latitude, longitude, and the drainage area at the top. And then for each uh, type of stream flow statistic, uh, you get a table of the basin characteristics for those uh, for that type. And as we scroll down, you also get tables of the flow statistics themselves, uh, labels, the values, units of measure, and then several um, indicators of the errors that are associated with those statistics. And there's a um, uh, stream stats web page that you can go to to get a description of, of uh, what all these error indicators mean. So uh, now we can also get um, stream gauge information. Uh, in this example, we've used the zoom to tool and we're zooming to a stream gauge. We've typed in the stream gauge number. We're clicking on find and it'll find the location of that gauge. Then we can click on the stream gauge information button and then on the location of the gauge and it pops open this little window with some information about the gauge and if you click on the site number it will uh, open up a web page that looks like this where you get the station number and name at the top. You get a link to uh, Endless Web which is the online database that provides all the time series information for the stream gauge. You get a table of descriptive information uh, followed by a table of the physical characteristics that have been previously published for the uh, site and then uh, stream flow statistics that, that have been published as well. So in both of these tables you have a column of citation number. Um, I won't go through these in a lot of detail. But if you get to the bottom, you have a table of citation numbers. So if you want to look and find out you know, when these uh, statistics were computed and how and so forth, uh, you have hyperlinks here that will take you to the reports and you can find out that information. <coughs> so there's some add-on functionality for several states. In Maryland and the Delaware River Basin, we are pro providing summaries of water use where you can delineate a basin and uh, get a summary of all the water withdrawals and, and discharges upstream from the site that's been delineated. That functioni functionality is currently in development for New York and Ohio as well. Um, there are several states that uh, stream stats provides the basin characteristics needed to um, run separate tools that you can use to get estimates of daily flows at ungauged sites. We have that available now for the Connecticut River Basin and for Pennsylvania. We are about ready to release it for the Delaware River Basin and it's in development for New York and Ohio. Also for Indiana, uh, Indiana has all the state agencies there have gotten together and uh, decided on certain flows that they want to use, peak flows, um, for large rivers that um, the method that they use depends on uh, what's going on there. Usually it's regulated streams and they may have run a model where they want to use that instead of a regression equation. So you, uh, you uh, click on a large river in Indiana and it'll either give you these prescribed flows or it'll give you regression equations depending on um, what the state feels is most appropriate. So uh, StreamStats has web services available that you can use if you have your own application uh, and you need like a basin delineation or something. Uh, you can go to StreamStats and, and uh, essentially issue a URL and get, get information back. Um, so for version 2, we can do that with basin delineations, stream gauge statistics, flow estimates that ungauge sites from regression equations and for computing. NHD reach addresses. In version 3, all uh, of our functionality is going to be available at web services. 
And the available web services link from the StrainStatch homepage will take you to more information about that. In addition, we have batch processing available where if you have a whole bunch of sites that you want information for, you don't have to do it one site at a, at a time. What you need to do is download um, a grid of the stream network that's available on our site, on our web page. And uh, for the sites that you're interested in getting information for, you need to snap those sites to the stream grid, save those in a shape file, upload the shape file, and then run it. And um, you'll get an output, you get an email with a uh, link to where the output is. Um, so StreamStats actually works. It's built on uh, ArcGIS server uh, in version 2, in Arc Hydro, Arc SDE. Uh, in uh, version 3, it's built on ArcGIS server 10.1 and 10.3. Um, we have it running on 17 servers in Denver now. Uh, it's going to be running on 5 after July 14th. And we're working on uh, adding failover uh, protection in the cloud. Uh, I'm running kind of late, so I'm, I'm going to just kind of move things up. Uh, this is sort of just a cartoon of, of uh, how things all work. We have what you see works in a web browser interface. Uh, through web services, it's uh, invoking a geoprocessing engine, uh, which is connected to a stream gauge a statistics database, a flow statistics calculation program, and a GIS database. And uh, the geoprocessing engine uh, does all the processing to delete the basins, compute basin characteristics, and so forth. Um, the StreamStats database uh, is an access database. It contains uh, over 5,600 regression equations, information for about 34,000 stream gauges, has over 1.5 million statistics. Um, we use the NSS program to uh, solve the regression equations, and that's a desktop program that you can download uh, if you go to the URL that's shown there. And uh, essentially, uh, StreamStats computes the basin characteristics, uh, sends them across the web to the NSS program, NSS computes the flow statistics, and sends them back to StreamStats. So uh, if you're not familiar with regression equations, this is an example where it's the median flow uh, for an area in West Virginia. And it's a constant times the drainage area raised to a power uh, times another constant, uh, which is uh, mean annual precipitation raised to a power. Um, and these, these uh, uh, variables that show up in the, requa the equations depend on uh, what flow statistic you're trying to estimate and where you are uh, in the U.S. and what the climatic and, and physiography, physiographic conditions are. So uh, the database, uh, con GIS database, uh, includes all the uh, data needed to delineate basins and compute basin characteristics and do stream navigation. Um, this the application is actually actually implemented. Uh, most of the work is done through cooperative agreements at our local water science centers. The local science centers um, prepare the GIS data sets and populate uh, the stream gauge database. And then uh, they hand off all the stuff that they have to the development team. We set it up on an internal test site. Uh, it gets evaluated when both the Science Center and the development team uh, are happy with things, then we make the site available to the public. Uh, the process that we use to allow for delineating basins is called burning and walling, where we take a stream network and we lay it over a digital elevation model. And um, it, wherever the stream network intersects the digital elevation model, we subtract a big number uh, from the elevation in the DEM. And we take a watershed boundary data set and also lay it over and, and add an elevation to that. So that's what you're seeing, the, uh, the walling from the basin boundaries and the burning uh, of the stream network. And so uh, typically we use uh, high resolution NHD with a 10 meter grid. 
uh, elevation grid and the WB data set. Uh, that's our preferred method. Uh, some states, particularly the western states, have used medium resolution uh, hydrography, sometimes from the NHD plus data set. And that involves 100 meter, 100, 100,000 scale NHD, uh, 30 meter NED, and same 1 to 24,000 scale WBD. So the USGS right now is in the process of trying to develop high resolution NHD plus at 1 to 24,000 scale nationally. Maine was the first site, uh, first state to have that, and we've used it to implement stream stats. We see that as the preferred method uh, for implementing stream stats in the future. Uh, and they'll have probably about a quarter of the country done uh, within the next year. And then LIDAR is really the long-term future. Uh, we have LIDAR-based data working for the French Broad River Basin in western North Carolina now. Uh, we have LIDAR-based data being used in South Carolina and in the St. Louis area in Missouri. Um, but it's a lot more expensive. It requires generating a new stream network. Uh, and there are concerns with, because it's so much more data, um, it's about 11 times more data if you use a 3 meter grid uh, than a 10 meter grid. Uh, so the concern is slowing down things and, and the, the uh, cost. So um, this year we're trying to release uh, several new sites uh, or states in version 3. Uh, we're going to convert all the states that we have now from version 2 to 3. We're adding regression equations for 14 states. We're completing programming for the version 4 interface. We plan to release network navigation tools in version 4 as they become available. So we'll probably have some states available in version 4 with network, some network navigation by early fall and we're hoping to have all of the tools available by the end of the calendar year. And we're also, as I mentioned, going to en enhance the similar gauges process. Uh, so this is a, a mock-up of uh, what version 4 is going to look like. Uh, it's going to be more user-friendly where uh, it's going to have panels for similar tools where uh, on the left here you see there's a panel for getting delineations and basin characteristics and you walk through a process where once you delineate, it takes you to the next step and tells you what to do and so forth. So it's going to be more uh, user-friendly in that way, and it's just going to have a, a cleaner look to it. So uh, in FY16, we're going to finish the navigation tools. We're going to add more uh, network events from NHD and NHD+. Plus. We're going to improve our documentation. Uh, we're going to implement some more functionality. Uh, and we're going to look at trying to implement non-participating states using the uh, high-res NHD plus as it comes out. So uh, as I mentioned, the, the application is at streamstats.usgs.gov. If you're using streamstats and you find a problem or you want to suggest new functionality, there's an email where you can reach the whole team, and that's gs w space streamstats at usgs.gov. And I've loaded up this presentation on FTP uh, if anyone's interested in downloading it. And I'll, I'll leave that up here if you, you want to write that down. And at this point, I'll ask if anyone has any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Colonel, for the great presentation. Seems sure. like this has quite a, bit of, quite a bit of use for our streams uh, team for the CMQ teams. <laughs> And so, also seems quite a, quite a powerful analysis tool with GIS data. So, um, at this time, if anyone has any questions, you can, you can please raise your hand on the webinar. We have a couple minutes here to spare. I'm not certain. I'm seeing uh, looks like a box or something for Jean Marie Haney. I'm not sure if that means she's raising her hand or if she's using like a phone. Uh, I think I she's a. Uh, on a mobile device. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so what I'll do right now is I'll unmute everyone and then we can have an open discussion. The conference is now in talk mode. Yeah, so uh, feel free to chime in if you have any questions for Colonel. Well, Colonel, uh, 
Colonel, this is Brett Bruce out in Denver. I'm, I'm always a little confused. This is not where you would go to get uh, current stream flow, generally. That's correct. Um, we do have links to uh, NWIS web where you can get current stream flow, but uh, StreamStats is primarily designed to provide stream flow statistics uh, that have been computed either at gauging stations or that you can estimate for ungauged sites. So can you give some examples of those types of statistics? Just so it would be things like the 100-year flood, the mean flow, seven-day, ten-year low flows, flow durations, uh, any kind of statistic that you could compute from the daily flows or the annual peak flows at uh, a gauging station. And there are actually hundreds of different types of statistics that have been computed. Yeah, thanks. I always kind of got confused by that, you know, but appreciate it. Sure. Cool. Thanks for the question, Brett. Um, are there any other questions from anyone on the phone? All right, great. Well, thank you everyone for, for participating. And thank you again, Colonel, for making the time to be with us today. Sure, and well, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it was a very thrilling presentation. Yeah, excellent presentation, thank you. Thank you. Now, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. And you can access our channel on our website or search for Desert LCC YouTube, and it will pop up. So once again, thanks everyone, and have a great day. Uh -huh.